Uh, David Anderson, our speaker today. He started his flying uh, in the fixed wing in 1969. And six years later, he qualified as a helicopter, helicopter flying instructor with the RAAF, um, in, uh, the RAF, I should say, in, in UK, performing uh, flying instructional uh, duties. Four years later, he resigned the Navy um, and conducting hel helicopter surveys and uh, mineral exploration. In December 1981, he joined the Victorian uh, police force as chief pilot. Eight years later, he joined Lloyd uh, Helicopters, proprietary limited, as chief pilot, operating 39 aircraft and employing 115 pilots in eight countries across Southeast Asia, primarily in support of the offshore oil in the in industry and the provision of the civil service and rescue for the RAAF. He left Lloyds in 1996 and joined the Civil Aviation Safety Authority for five years as Flying Operations Inspector and Examiner. Uh, he, has then, he was then given the opportunity to join the Royal Oman Police uh, and a, as Aviation Advisor and Senior Training and Checking Pilot for the provision of helicopter emergency med medical receive <laughs> retrieval for His Majesty the Sultan of Oman. Four years later, he, approached, he was approached in 2004 to take the position, position of Chief Pilot, Australian Helicopter. Um, that is, that's the uh, job he has today, and manage, the managing Chief Pilot of the Government of South Australia State Rescue. I invite David to speak to us. I'm glad he's left me a little bit of time to talk. But thank you, Tom. I appreciate the words. Um, <clears throat> I've got to squash an hour's talk into 20 minutes, so I'm going to get on with this pretty quickly. Uh, it's interesting. Um, we've recently been purchased. So when I talk about Australian helicopters, we are still Australian helicopters. We still undertake the, the role of service provided to the government of South Australia which is what I'm going to be talking about today, but we're actually now owned by a UK operational group called Babcock International, and we've been rebranded um, Mission Critical Services. Now, Babcock's a big company. It does uh, produces everything from submarines to wheelchairs in the UK. I thought that uh, wheelchairs was a bit strange till they told me there was 10 million of them and they overhaul them as well as supply them, so it's quite a good cash flow. Um, <clears throat> okay. Now it's going. Thank you. You get the sales pitch first. Australian Helicopters is as I said, now owned by Babcock International, but I needed to put this up to show you what we actually do. And all those red helicopters there are our bases. <clears throat> the two green ones, Latrobe Valley and Bendigo, they actually join us 1st of January next year. They're two additional bases that we're putting online in Victoria. And it'll mean something to you when I basically show you the next one. So that's what I manage. I'm still the chief pilot of the entire organisation and that's my flight operations uh, portfolio. Uh, if you just have a look down there, you'll see that the 10412 is valued at between 10 and 12 million dollars US each. The BK117 is a bit of an orphan that sits here in South Australia. But over the bottom down the right, the AW139, that's the aircraft we're putting into Victoria next year for Ambulance Victoria, the government, government service, and they're $17 million each. So the portfolio there is about close to $280 million worth of aircraft. A 
With that amount of money invested, you could probably guess we don't do too much in the way of light charter. <clears throat> <laughs> All of our clients are major government, what we call blue chip clients. And if you read down, you'll see that the government, the Commonwealth government, we're providing coast watch and border protection out of Horn Island in uh, far north Queensland. Australian Maritime Safety Authority search and rescue. Defence Army is a new contract to us. It's uh, provision of two helicopters that support the army for medical evacuation of their personnel who may get injured or ill whilst on deployment within Australia, so during major exercises. Queensland Government with uh, emergency management services in Mackay, Rockhampton and Horn Island. Newcastle Ports Corporation doing marine pilot transfer. South Australian Government, which is what I'm going to be talking about today, the State Rescue Helicopter Service. And the Victorian Government uh, Ambulance Victoria contract, currently in place with two aircraft, but expanding to six in January of next year. It'll go. Here you go. <clears throat> okay, so the South Australian State Rescue Helicopter Service, we have what we call our client users. So the government owns the contract. It's administered by the Attorney General's Department. And the clients that use the service are the South Australian Police, the State Medical Retrieval Service, which is part of SAS, so Department of Health and SAS are now the same uh, client user. The Country Fire Service and <clears throat> a small component of OSSAR or the Australian Search and Rescue Organisation. When we were bought by Babcock, it was important for them to know what we managed to achieve with only three helicopters. And in the United Kingdom, there would be close to 200 helicopters providing the service that we provide to the state with three. And those pictures of South Australia and the UK are actually proportional. <clears throat> so they've been scaled. And those red lines show you some typical long range missions that we undertook in the last 12 months. The one to the north uh, was a wife and a couple of kids off the roof of a house when the floodwaters came down from Queensland and isolated them. The ones offshore are typically to vessels at sea. Okay, so the client users, and I've got a couple of little videos in here that will make some sense of what we do day to day. The first one that was on the list was SAPOL. We provide the pilot and the SAPOL, South Australian Police, provide the observers for the operations that we conduct. And there's a, a number of different tasks that are undertaken on behalf of the police. Patrol and surveillance is primarily the, the greater percentage of tasking that we do. And it can be done either covertly or quite what I would call in your face policing. So covertly we'll sit anywhere between nine and 11,000 feet using the little EC-130. It's an aircraft that is quiet, so at nine or 10,000, you won't see us and you won't hear us. But we have a camera on board that can record and track um, quite accurately anybody who's on the ground. The overt side of it is what you probably complain about most nights when you hear us at three or 400 feet. And that's because we want to be down there, and we're down there for a reason. We're either locking down the suspect or we're actively tracking the suspect. So to underdo the, uh, undertake the surveillance activities, as well as visual, we have electronic capability. Now, what I'm going to show you is a couple of short video clips that show what we see. Now, both of these pictures are being taken with thermal imaging cameras, so it's not a visual camera, 
It's a thermal imaging camera. The picture you're looking at is not actually a video picture. It's a picture of a temperature differential. So a body who is standing around today, about 38 degrees, if I'm standing outside and it's 16, I'm going to be hotter than the ambient. So in these pictures, you'll see that Well, I'm hoping that it works. This is now thermal imaging. So the white colour is the heat difference between the fellow and the ground. Don't ever run from a police dog. You look like you're doing all right at the moment. <laughs> oh, I'm serious about that. You might see the copper who might be a little bit overweight. You think, I can run away from him. What you can't run away from is his dog. And remember, we're looking at heat differences. Pick the obvious house that's growing hydroponics. In this case, the roof is dark. We've put the camera to identify dark as being hot as opposed to white as being hot. And either that roof has got something inside it that's of interest or the house is on fire. In this particular case, <clears throat> and if you're growing thermals, I don't want to know about it, but anyway, uh, if you're growing hydroponic crops in a house, you need to get rid of the temperature that's in the grow room. If you put it outside through the windows, your neighbours will smell the hydroponics. So most people vent it into their roof cavity thinking that's pretty safe. What it does to us is it, it stands out quite obviously to us. We do a patrol, it takes us two hours. We go up and log anywhere between 60 and 80 suspect houses. We then give that list with the addresses to the people on the ground, it takes them two months to clear it. So we only do a patrol every two, two months because they can't keep up with the work that we generate from the air. Okay, this is a, a little bit more drastic. This is a police pursuit with, of an armed offender. All the white at the back of that car is in fact where his tyres have been spiked. So now the, the road, the sparks, the tyres are all emitting heat. So that's what we're looking at. The helicopter in this stage is also being used to protect the people on the ground. You'll hear the officer in a minute. This guy's got a shotgun. Needless to say, he committed suicide. <laughs> now, I didn't pick the music, Saypol put the music on for me, all right? This is the other side of policing. This is now high-risk policing. Not used very often in Adelaide, but trained for. Typically counter-terrorism. It's been used occasionally for um, armed offenders in housing 
rural environments. I'm going to stop it because I'm going to run out of time if we get bogged down watching Sapol jump out of helicopters. <laughs> Suffice to say that's probably the more fun stuff that we do. Um, a lot of this observation and, and surveillance we're doing is with cameras, but it is obvious that when we're not looking for crooks in metropolitan areas, we need to have capability to fly around at night. So we use what's called enhanced devices. So the big thing sitting on the front of my helmet, there are goggles. And what they give you is a different view of the world. On the left-hand side of the screen, that's what you'd see if you're looking out the window of the helicopter. The right-hand side of the screen, you're looking at the world through the goggles. And that flashlight is actually a mobile phone. More importantly for me as a pilot, I can see the ground. And instead of seeing the light, we can now see there's two survivors. So night vision is something that's come into helicopter operations within the civil market probably within the last five years and it is almost now invaluable. The next client that we've got is the uh, ambulance service <coughs> and the ambulance service provide us the special operations team paramedics so they're the fellows who we use to go up and down on the rescue cable and they're the people who deliver the first primary aid to the survivors. Again, I'll probably cut this short um, only because it'll go on for about five minutes and I don't want to run out of time. So that's our Bell 412. Bit of vision from in the cockpit. What's occurring here is the crewman's advising the pilot where he needs the aircraft position for this recovery. The guys in the green are the special operations team paramedics. And the guy down the bottom, which you'll see in a minute, fell down and fractured his skull climbing out near um, Sedan. A lot of this is very high risk. It's managed with training, uh, supervision, currency and competency checks conducted routinely, and that enables you to do this sort of stuff without placing ourselves at risk. So that's the bottom end of it. I might just let it run for a little bit because um, there's some stuff in a minute that I wanted you to see. I've got to point this out because that's me flying. That's a rescue paramedic. We, don't, we have males and females. And that's the police boat. Now I'm going to put her on that boat and hopefully she won't fall over the side. I can't actually see the boat while this is happening. Uh, the rescue crewman in the back is doing the con. So he's telling me forwards, backwards, left, right. This is one that uh, is a real one. This is a family of five. Their boat turned over. And you'll see them in the water in a minute.
The second part of the uh, health side is the medical retrieval stuff, and this is, uh, you'll see a bunch of different colours here, and I'm not referring to the blood. Um, the red suits are the doctors and nurses provided to us from MedStar. The green suits are the paramedics that we carry ourselves. They're the people going up and down on the cables. <clears throat> and uh, this is fairly typical of what we deal with. Uh, in med medical retrieval alone, it involves two aspects, primary transport, which is direct to the scene of the incident or the accident, and into hospital transfer, where you go to a rural facility and bring somebody who's quite unwell back to a major hospital. And that includes, of course, the good ones, which are the little neonates. We do probably around six of them a month. Um, but the medical retrieval, we fly about 900 missions a year just in medical retrieval alone. The, uh, the fellow at the bottom who's got his chest opened up, um, he came out of that car that's above him on the right and he actually survived. Country Fire Service, we provide four aircraft, two from the government and two under a federal government arrangement with the National Aerial Firefighting Council. And we run from about November through to the end of March, sometimes into April, depending what the fire danger period is, providing the uh, aerial observers for the fixed wing firebombing fleet. So you can't leave it to a pilot where you want to drop the water because he'll drop it somewhere nice and easy and get out of there and go back and get some more. And it's actually nice to drop it where it might do some good. So the aerial observers from the CFS actually use the target definition. Um, I'll say you saw some of those uh, lines that went off coast. That one up the top, that was a catamaran being sailed from Perth to Sydney to be delivered, brand spanking new. Uh, hit a catamaran, uh, hit a sea container, uh, 126 nautical miles off the bottom of Kangaroo Island. And there was five survivors in the dinghy, so four adults and one adolescent girl. Uh, the one down the bottom's a helicopter on a tanker off the coast. The reason the fixed wing's there is because we go that far out that somebody has to actually look after us. So they provide our communications link and they also provide our search and rescue coverage. The one on the right down the bottom, that black charred mess used to be the Channel 2 helicopter at uh, Lake Air. And our helicopter left at uh, 7.30 in the evening on the receipt of the phone call that been a suspected crash. By the time it got to Lake Air, it was just after midnight, so they were the first on the site to be able to confirm that there was uh, no survivors from that accident. Okay, so we do all this work with um, not very many of us. So since we started the operation, which was 2006, January, <clears throat> to date we've done uh, 14,600 missions, and that's taken us just over 16,000 hours. So a mission's about an hour. It's not really, but that's what it averages. Obviously, if we're going to Lake Air, it's about six hours both ways. But if we're going from Adelaide to Yorktown, it's 15 minutes. It takes the road ambulance three and a half hours to drive around. So short distance jobs still take three to four hours to achieve, but the flight time within it is not quite high. So I've got nine operational crews, and I actually use myself as a spare. <clears throat> nine crewmen, so our, our normal routine crewing for the operation is one pilot, one crewman, and we use all the, the uh, additional crewmen suppi supplied by the government, so police, fire, and medical. To keep the whole thing running, which is the three aircraft, we have uh, five engineers, basically, two senior base engineers, uh, three licensed engineers, one avionics radio guy who looks after the ra um, radios, and one apprentice. There's an administration girl um, and myself. And then we've got a little contract on the end, which is Channel 7. Done? That's all right. Because there was only two slides left. I'll, um, do you want to shut that down?
perfect. Thank you, David, for a very interesting uh, talk. Uh, I've learnt a lot. Um, and helicopters, another field from what I'm in. <laughs> Thank you very much, David. And we'll Thank you, Tom. Apparently we've got uh, time for questions. Thanks very much. That's uh, absolutely fascinating. So Take the mic. my question is, do you provide most of the capability, like all the sensors and stuff? Do, do the clients provide any of that or are your aircraft kitted out for them? And therefore that means that your people are, are the sort of go-to guys in terms of expertise and so on. That's exactly right. So we provide the entire service other than the people. So all the cameras, all the avionics, radios, surveillance, all ours. Yes. Yeah, let's do it. Um, thanks, David. I, I was lucky enough to be invited on a fantastic day when we were taken to your place with four Ferraris and to fall off to McLaren, really, my memory was there. You didn't fly our helicopter, but there was one of your flights. And it was a sensational day. We had lunch in McLaren Bay and come back. How much would it cost? Yeah, those little helicopters that, that you travelled in, the little AS350, they're used by the National Firefighting Council and General Charter during the year. When they're not utilised by them, we make them available to the general public. They're about $2,000 an hour. If you think of the big ones, though, the contract costs, standing charges, they run to about nearly $9,000 an hour. Yep. Yes, Dick. Thank you both for a talk. How did the aerodynamics change from flying the chopper when you put people hanging off the stretchers and people to life? I wouldn't personally do it, but uh, it, 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 it doesn't change the aerodynamics of it at all. It, it's a helicopter, it flies in the hover as well as it flies in cruise. The only thing, difference we get is that all of a sudden your risk factors are up because the, the potential to have that person who's suspended impact the aircraft on the way up or impact something on the way up, uh, wrap himself around the, the antenna on a boat, for example. So we have to manage that very, very carefully and that requires a lot of training and that's what that um, putting our rescue crewmen into the back of the uh, police boats while they're underway. That's what that's all about. Continual training to manage the risk. Thank you, David. Thank We're you. We're out of time now. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> Thank you.